Kapustin Yar, a top-secret military facility located 60 miles southeast of the former Stalingrad and 500 miles south of Moscow. Built under the personal direction of Joseph Stalin, it is Russia's oldest and largest military facility. Its activities over the past 60 years have fueled controversy over what really goes on behind these walls. Kapustin Yar or Vladimirovka as a call it initially it was called it was uh, and it still is is the first russian space range i am vladimir semenov and i was with kgb for 26 years kapustin yar everything was top secret it was nothing there not secret i am sergey khrushchev son and former prime minister of soviet union nikita khrushchev less than a year after the roswell crash made headlines around the world Many believe that this Russian base may have experienced a landmark UFO encounter and crash of its own. June 19, 1948, early evening. According to reports, Kapustin Yar's air traffic controller sees a strange object appear on his radar screen. At the exact same moment, a MiG pilot about 10 kilometers downrange from the base sees a large silver cigar-shaped UFO directly in front of him. He radios back to the base that he's being blinded by a bright light. A Russian pilot encountered a UFO in 1948 and tried to attack it with extremely unfortunate results for both. The pilot was blinded by rays of light emanating from the UFO. It is believed that under direct orders from Soviet Air Force Commander-in-Chief Zugarov, the pilot engaged the UFO for almost three minutes before launching a missile that was finally able to bring the object down. But unlike Roswell, this crash never made the papers. It's 1948, it's a secret air base, suddenly a, a cylinder appears over Russia's most sensitive air base. They scramble the MiGs, it's a dogfight. Russian pilots are good. And imagine this plane getting right on top of that craft. The MiGs fire their rockets as the directed particle beam weapon explodes the MiG and they both go down. Reports suggest that the blinded pilot in his final attempt to regain control of his MiG was hit by the object's weapons and perished along with his airplane. What did the aliens use? What were they firing? What they were probably using was a particle beam weapon. We know what the MiG used. It was the things that the Russians were using at the time. It was firing its guns, it was firing its rockets, and it was firing some very early version of a missile. Somehow, that MiG was able to break up the anti-gravity envelope that surrounded the craft. The cigar-shaped object couldn't stay aloft anymore and crashed. And the Russian retrieval teams overjoyed that they have their first spacecraft jump on this thing and they take it underground to Zitker and the Russian secret UFO program begins. I'm Bill Burns, publisher of UFO magazine. Let's face it, everybody wants to get his hand on a flying saucer. It's a wonderful weapons delivery and defense system. I'm Stanton Friedman. I'm a nuclear physicist, lecturer, ufologist. This 1948 crash is one of many strange events that has turned Kapustin Yar into an even more mystifying version of America's Roswell and Area 51. The Soviets had to get their hands on what we had. We had the Roswell crash. We really had a storehouse of technology that we developed in, in the early 1960s out of Roswell. The Russians didn't have that. Well, how do you get that technology? It doesn't just fall out of the sky. You go after it. And the Russians went after it by embarking on suicide missions. Anything they could do to get their MiG pilots to shoot down an extraterrestrial spacecraft was fair game. From the time it was constructed in the early 1940s, Kapustin Yar was cloaked in secrecy. It is a place where it is said the Soviet Union's top researchers, scientists, and military specialists were sent to develop highly classified Cold War technology and weaponry. I know everything because I spent months and years in the Kapustin Yar working there testing our cruise missiles that we designed for the Soviet submarine to sink American aircraft carriers. Kapustin Yar was on a very short list of facilities that the U.S. intelligence wanted to get imagery of. Uh, there are basically the three things going on there. They're testing surface-to-air missiles, they're testing surface-to-surface -surface ballistic missiles, 
and they're also testing air launch missiles, cruise missiles. All three are going on at the same place, and so it's of high interest to U.S. intelligence. In fact, the building of the base was so secretive that when a small town nearby was deemed by the Soviet military to be too close for comfort, its residents were evacuated, and it was simply eliminated. The name of the town? Zitkur. Zitkur is a small town just a few miles downrange of the Kapusinyar uh, test complex, and basically probably what happened was the Russians uh, decided that, that, that due to people seeing uh, what was being tested, it would be better to just close that town off. Many researchers believe the name Zitkur was subsequently assigned to the highly classified subterranean UFO research center beneath Kapustin Yar. There is an idea that in Zitkur and Kapustin Yar there is a storage point for crashed UFOs and corpses of the visitors and, and members of their crew. Zitkur is analogous to what Area 51 is to Nellis Air Force Base and Groom Lake in Nevada. Different countries have various places where they take their UFO technology. And what they do with it is they, 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 they try to break it down. They see what it is and how can we reverse engineer this. But long before the 1948 crash, the area around Kapustin Yar and the skies over Russia have been home to many other well-documented and eerie encounters with UFOs. Some date back to a time before what we know as Russia even existed. Russia is a huge land. UFOs have been sighted over its territories for, I would say, thousands of years. I am Paul Stonehill, co-author of UFO USSR. One which is quite famous was cited back about 950 AC by an international traveler of the time, Ibn Fadlan. He and his co-travelers were able to see strange sightings in the sky that scared them immensely. But the local people would laugh at them and say, we see it quite often. Aerial battles, beings fighting each other, strange aircraft, something that's similar to a Star Wars battle scene from a modern movie. Amazing stuff. Legend has it that the spectacular aerial battles that played out in the skies gave the Arab warriors strength and courage to defeat their enemies during the next day's fight. In the 17th century, Russia experienced a rash of UFO sightings. These objects were described by many who witnessed them as comet-shaped balls of fire. The most famous one would be the Rob Ozero incident when a very unusual, huge uh, disk fiery disk came, uh, arrived in the area of a northern Russian lake. One eyewitness submitted the following account. On this, the 15th day of August in the year 1663, a great crash sounded out from the heavens. Around the stroke of midday, there descended upon Robo Zero a great ball of fire from the clearest of skies. In front of the fire, there were two fiery beams. It went from south to the west. It was about 500 meters away when it vanished. But once again, it returned staying over Robozero for one hour and a half, filling all those who saw it with a great dread. This documented account goes on to detail fishermen scalded by the burning lake, along with glowing fish that flung themselves onto the ground to escape the looming fireball. Stories like what they saw over Robozero were common in pre-revolutionary Russia and outside of Russia and Europe. When we speak specifically of sightings on the territory of the Soviet Union, Percentages are very high, more than 50% that these UFO sightings would be some sort of fiery, sphere-shaped UFO. Another extraordinary sighting took place over Moscow in 1892. An eyewitness report was later published in the March 17, 1892 edition of the Russian newspaper Svet. The pillar of light was pointed straight down to the earth, forming a cone-shaped bundle of rays in the color of ordinary flames. The brightness was considerable and could sometimes be compared to the brightness of an electrical street lamp. The point from which the rays originated didn't move during the whole time, and the rays were visible for 20 to 25 minutes. While enormous fireballs have been sighted over Russia for centuries, there have been none bigger or more devastating than the event that leveled the Siberian forest of Tunguska in 1908. And of course it was one of the theories which have to appear that it was not a comet was not meteorite, that in reality it was a spacecraft. Coming up, 
did a UFO explode over Tunguska. It is believed that not one but two objects collided over the Tunguska in 1908, equal to many Hiroshima's. And later, what happened to the wreckage of the 1948 crash at Russia's Roswell? Hurtling through the solar system, a speck of cosmic dust strikes the Earth. Commonly, these meteors are vaporized by friction in the atmosphere. This is part of the story of one that wasn't. A meteor that landed in 1908 in Siberia with the destructive force of a cannonball. June 30th, 1908, approximately 7 a.m., the tranquil forest of Tunguska, Siberia, was rocked by a deafening, earth-shattering explosion. The explosion packed the power of a 40 megaton hydrogen bomb. Large trees snapped like tiny twigs as the explosion decimated the dense forest. The effects of the blast were felt as far away as Western Europe and were at first believed to have been caused by a giant meteor smashing into Earth. My own personal conclusion is that that was Mother Nature showing off, if you will, but that there was no intelligence beside, behind what happened there. It wasn't a rocket, it wasn't a bomb sent to let us know that aliens are watching you earthlings. Literally a catastrophe from outer space. Yet UFO researchers say if this devastating explosion was the result of a meteor, why were there no craters found in or around Tunguska? It is something scientists to this day have had trouble explaining. This was, let's call it an explosion, although some people call it an implosion. Whole kilometers of the taiga forest were destroyed. The event itself caused changes in the magnetic field of our planet. The academic establishment is of the opinion that the Tunguska event was simply a meteor. But there are many facts that speak to the idea that it was on the contrary, rational guided flight. It made a turn, which is something that a natural object or meteor could not have done. What was it that could have done that level of devastation and not leave a crater? Modern-day UFO researchers were not the first to suspect that the Tunguska event was the work of something other than a meteor. Reports suggest that Stalin believed the Tunguska blast was the result of a UFO that had launched some sort of experimental weapon. Stalin was interested in the acquired information to determine whether UFOs presented an immediate threat to the Soviet security. That's why he used some of his top scientists to give him an assessment. Scientists like Karolev studied UFO materials. Sergei Korolev, one of the Soviet Union's most celebrated scientists, would go on to become the father of the Russian space program and the man responsible for Sputnik. Along with Stalin, he was determined to solve the mystery of Tunguska. These observations prompted him to finance an expedition to the place where the Tunguska event happened. Sergei Karolev used his own money to send an expedition to the Tunguska area in helicopters. Karolev never met with Stalin. There were some researchers who was looking to prove that Karolev really met with Stalin, but they didn't find any record. Stalin presumed it really could have been a spaceship. He wanted to find the fragments of that ship, put it back together, and recreate the object for military purposes. Initially, Korolev found that many of the physical scars left behind at Tunguska were still visible. But the most shocking discovery came in the form of radioactive metallic fragments found at the site. Debris uncharacteristic of any asteroid or meteor. If you go along the flight path of the Tunguska object and continue past the crash site, you reach an area that Russian ufologists call the Devil's Graveyard. It's a 300 square meter area where not a single plant grows and animals die. It also has a higher than normal radioactivity level. This is a result of what might possibly be a radioactive metallic fragment from the crash. The radiation levels were there. I mean, meteors don't come down with that level of radiation. So one of the stories is it was a mothership that detonated. It is believed that Korolev privately told Stalin that the incident at Tunguska had indeed been caused by a UFO, fragments of which were still scattered around the area. However, in his top-secret official report, 
Korolov is said to have told a much different story. The official party line, Tunguska, was the result of a giant meteor. The whole point was, if the information serves the bureaucracy, good. If it doesn't, it doesn't exist. So where were the radioactive fragments from Tunguska taken? Some believe the evidence was transported to Kapustin Yar's underground base, Zitkur. Different countries have various places where they take their UFO technology. Well, the Soviets basically had one at Zitkur, and it was where they could try to figure out what the technology is and how do we use it. And of course, the security around those bases is essentially shoot-to-kill security. Was Stalin's team of scientists inside the underground lab of Zitkur using UFO wreckage to advance their fledgling missile defense and space programs? They had a couple of people, men, at the top of their program who really pushed the space program. I'm Fred Kulik at Caltech. The uh, head of the space program had direct connection to Stalin and later Khrushchev. In their quest to acquire UFO technology to beat the Americans in the space race, it has been reported that top Soviet military officials ordered MiG pilots to shoot down UFOs as far back as World War II, a time just before the Russian Roswell crash of 1948. So that gives you a two-pronged concern about UFOs. One, you want the new technology to top the other guys' flying technology. And two, we need to be on the alert for new stuff from them. So either way, you want your guys to shoot them down. As the word spread that UFO wreckage from Tunguska and the 1948 incident were being studied at Zitkur, Russia's Cold War enemies were becoming more and more intrigued by what might be going on above and below the top secret military base. The CIA had agents in the Soviet Union back in 1950s who had reported on UFOs and the CIA was very much interested in what was happening in the Soviet Union. Coming up, shocking, never-before-seen U-2 reconnaissance photos of Kapustin Yar. And later, an underground tour of Zitkur, revealing for the first time ever the base within the base at the center of Russia's Roswell. In the early stages of the Cold War, the Soviet military test site of Kapustin Yar became a hotbed of secret activity. Activity that involved advanced weapon, missile, and rocket tests. So after World War II and the development of the atomic bomb, they were not able to build small atomic weapons. So they had to build big rockets to carry them. Unlike the U.S., I mean, we still had fairly sizable rockets, but we could miniaturize things to a certain extent, much better than they could. So from the very beginning, they envisioned large rockets, and that really gave them a start on the space program as well. The Russians had one of the scariest pieces of paper I've seen in one of the 20 archives I've been to, said that the Russians have made more progress in the past 18 months in the development of nuclear weapons and methods for delivering them than had been anticipated for five years. That was in 1951. By the early 1950s, rumors of UFO activity and experiments at Kapustin Yar had indeed leaked beyond Soviet borders. Alarming news that some say may have prompted the U.S. to find out once and for all if the Soviets had gotten their hands on UFO technology. Kapustin Yar and Zikr were at the top of our military watch in the same way that Area 51 and Wright-Patterson Air Force Base on Los Alamos were at the top of their military watch. Tim Brown is a senior analyst at globalsecurity.org. His specialty? Interpretation of top secret satellite and spy imagery for both private and governmental agencies. Kapustin Yar was in the top 10% of facilities that the U.S. intelligence was, was monitoring in Russia, and that's evidenced by just the sheer volume of um, declassified documents that are available that show that there was a consistent, ongoing interest in what was going on at that facility. Not long after the United States had developed its most sophisticated spying machine to date, the U-2 spy plane, the first mission was to, where else, Kapustin Yar. This is probably the first time anyone outside of the CIA or the intelligence communities looked at this, the U-2 imagery of Kapustin Yar. 
reconnaissance couldn't reveal can now be seen for the very first time in this exclusive underground tour of what could be the nerve center of all Soviet UFO activity, Zitkur. Based on reports and drawings from Russian UFO expert Anton Anfalov, seen in the West for the first time, this rendering is what might possibly be the first glimpse ever of this secret cryptic facility a quarter mile below Kapustin Yar. Let's say that you get a chance to go down there to the most secret Russian UFO laboratory. It's not glorious, high-tech, and brightly lit. It's dank, it's dark, and it's dingy. It's Russian. It's extremely compartmentalized. It's like an underground shopping mall, except inside the mall are all these rooms where there's exotic technology being taken apart and put back together. In this hub, they're doing autopsies on alien bodies. In that hub, they're reconstructing an engine. Then you've got these fantastic Rube Goldberg machines. What they are are machines to test various components, and then finally you come upon these huge underground hangars. And what you're struck by is that there are no airplanes in the hangars. There are these long, cigar-shaped, cylinder-shaped craft in various stages of disrepair because they've crashed, and they're going to try and reverse engineer these. That's what you'd see at this base. Is this the secret location where the wreckage from the 1948 Russian Roswell crash was taken, along with fragments from the Tunguska UFO? I cannot deny rumors of the so-called captured UFOs. The Soviets tried to recover lost fragments of their secret tests, and it would be convenient to them to say, yes, UFOs is something that we captured, the UFO is in our hands, but why would they keep the secrecy on the subject of UFOs so tight? And did this heavily guarded experimental facility specialize in reverse engineering designed to destroy the United States? If Kapustin Yar is where you're doing your advanced development work, rocketry, aircraft, weaponry, laser weapons, all this kind of stuff, where you need high security and a good setting for your scientists and major computer facilities, then you'd expect that that's where they'd be doing their UFO, advanced UFO research. Not UFOs 101, uh, UFOs 404. It, it's just natural to do that. And of course you'd have underground bases, You'd have protection against intruding aircraft. You'd be looking out for the U-2s. Another mysterious aspect of Kapustin Yar are the many strange patterns on the ground. Did Stalin and Korolev strategically arrange these patterns to attract UFOs to the base? Some researchers believe the Russians may have borrowed this idea from ancient civilizations whose pyramids are said to have been constructed in geometric shapes and patterns designed to attract inhabitants from other worlds. Looking at Kapustin Yar from the air, there's a lot of uh, facilities, markings, patterns that might, to the untrained eye, look like they're from another planet or not of this Earth. They might look like something that you'd see in South America with the Mayan cultures or maybe crop circles. Between the reported UFO crashes and the ultra-top-secret research, how did the Soviets flaunt their advances at Kapustin Yar? Now there was a new date for Russian youngsters to remember. October 4, 1957, when Sputnik, the first Earth satellite, was launched. October 4, 1957. The Soviet Union space program successfully launches the world's first artificial satellite into orbit. In the history of the Earth, no other event had captured the imagination of so many people as this first step into space. Four years later, the Russians once again beat the Americans by launching Yuri Gagarin into space in the first manned flight to orbit the Earth. Two feats that put the Soviet Union way out in front in the ultra-competitive space race. We are the first and all next steps in space for I would say for nearly 10 years, Soviets was ahead of the United States. First, first man into space, first woman into space, first walk into space, first render walls in space, first document space, and so on and so forth, until 1981 when the shuttle was launched. <laughs> I'm sure the Russians have done their darnest to reverse 
engineer anything they can get their hands on, whether it's American or German or alien. Coming up, relive what many believe to be a spectacular UFO crash at the actual site in a village near Kapustin Yar. I don't recommend that we stay here any longer. It's already harmful. Let's leave here and, and go to some place where no unknown forces can act upon us and influence us. And find out exactly what the KGB knew about dogfights between MiGs and UFOs at Kapustin Yar as we open the mysterious KGB Blue File. Russia's foremost authority on UFOs is a man so legendary and popular around the country that he is known only by his last name. Ajaja. On this spot of the UFO landing, an American group is filming for the first time. He was very popular at the peak of the uh, UFO activity in the Soviet Union. It was late 60s, 70s. At that time it was not permitted, but not restricted to talk about this. Ajaja invited the History Channel on an exclusive tour of a reported UFO crash site not too far from the site of the Russian Roswell crash of 1948. For that, I have to stand there, on that particular corner. Using two copper rods, Ajaja begins the tour by testing the ambient energy that the crash site still emits today. What? There it is. A negative sign right there. Damn. What to that? Down there, that way. So here, in this spot, occurred the crash landing of a flying saucer. First I'm going to go directly across. Then I'll go perpendicularly. Then I'll go by the diagonals. This is where the boundary begins. All right, I'm going towards the center. In the center we see a lot of plant growth and compact. And what's most important is that here it shows a positive signal. Now we are going towards the border. Now they're showing neutral. And here, here's the other part of the border. Right from here to over there. Now I'm going away from the center, toward the other side. Ajaja is walking the 100-foot by 20-foot outline of a cigar-shaped UFO that reportedly crash-landed here in 1961. Again, now we're going back. It shows a powerfully strong signal. See how it's turning? It's powerfully positive. We're going back. Negative. There. There it is. See? Here's where the border is. We got one point over there. Another point over there. Three point and four point. Animals avoid this place. They go around it. Cattle don't graze here. Yes, there is unknown energy, which, as experience shows, affects people in a negative fashion. Your pulse changes. The heartbeat changes. You grow short of breath. You begin to sweat. Okay. I don't recommend you stay here any longer, because it's already harmful. Come on. Let's leave here. For a normal place, where no unknown forces will influence us and act upon us. Ajaja's account of this UFO crash was supported by a resident of adjacent Shodnya village, who upon seeing Ajaja, told her account of seeing the crash out of her window which overlooks the site from less than 200 yards away. Well, it was 4 or 5 in the evening. It was later in the day. And suddenly my mother screamed. She said, hey, look at that. There was some kind of ball, a sphere that flew by. And then she said, oh, it's, it's probably a flying saucer. And it was a big, fiery red sphere that flew by. The sphere went over there, past the train tracks, and went down into the valley of the river Skunya, right down and over the river. 
Experts like Ajaja believe that UFO events like this crash, as well as the 1948 Russian Roswell crash, caused a Pandora's box to open over Kapustin Yar, leading to what some have called a war in the skies over Russia. Pilots would often receive orders from the ground to defend their airspace and shoot down UFOs. Other times, the UFOs would go on terrifying attacks. What intrigues me about the Russians as much as anything is apparent dogfights between UFOs. And I've read several accounts of that, several of them having dogfights. Perhaps the most compelling evidence of encounters between Soviet MiGs and UFOs over Kapustin Yar comes firsthand from the most celebrated of all Soviet test pilots, Marina Popovich. A national hero, a cosmonaut, perhaps the Chuck Yeager of Russia. She says that she witnessed actual battles between Soviet pilots and UFOs. One incident in 1964 occurred during a Soviet Air Force training mission. Alexander Kopeikin. Alexander Kopeikin was the commander of a squadron and a pilot instructor in one of the flight schools. One day he was flying with a cadet and they were attacked by a UFO. They went into a spiral dive. While on another top secret military expedition in February 1980, Colonel Popovich encountered multiple unidentified objects in the skies over Russia. I saw three fireballs, three amazing lights in the form of a triangle, and I observed them as they flew away. Another MiG test pilot, Colonel Vyatkin Lev Mikhailovich, agreed to tell his first-person account for our cameras for the very first time. August 7th, 1967, 6.30 in the evening. Colonel Mikhailovich reports that his MiG was momentarily captured in mid-air by a UFO. When I was making the aerial move to the left, suddenly from above I saw a light. This big disc began to slowly light up, and I just had time to quickly tilt the plane, but the wing hit the ray of light. The plane shook and the gauges and instruments began to move from right to left, right to left. It is as though the ray of light dissolved into shining little points of light. Imagine my surprise when my technician named Mikhail said, Lev Mikhailovich, the wing of the airplane is glowing. As it turns out, for a whole week in the hangar, the left wing was glowing with a white light. They washed the wing with kerosene, and soon after that, the glowing ended. Fortunately, Colonel Mikhailovich's encounter with a UFO over the skies of Kapustin Yar in the 1960s did not end as dreadfully as the famous 1948 encounter in the same skies. No, I wasn't scared. I was just puzzled. I was particularly stunned that the ray of light turned out to be hard because I felt the impact. As UFO reports continued to stream into the Soviet government from both civilians and military officials, the KGB was busy covering up the reports, silencing those who made them, and clamping down on the press. But all the while, the spy agency was creating an official report on UFO activity in the USSR called the KGB Blue File. Americans will never understand this. You know, because you have to be inside KGB to know the power KGB had. And during Stalin time, KGB was unbelievable powerful. Written and researched over the 20-year span between the mid-60s and the mid-80s, the KGB Blue File was one of the most extensive official explorations of UFOs ever commissioned by any governmental agency anywhere. The KGB Blue File is a 124-page collection of documents released in 1990. I believe this is not everything the KGB has had in their hands, and I'm not the only one. The Blue File compiled thousands of reports of UFO sightings, dogfights, and crashes, all of which were described in vivid detail. According to the Blue File, as recently as March 21st, 1990, the residents of a dozen Russian towns not too far from the gates of Kapustin Yar all witnessed the exact same UFO sighting between 10 and 11.30 p.m. The following is from the written account of a KGB internal affairs officer. After obtaining more exact information, it was established that a rather large number of residents in nearby cities became eyewitnesses of a UFO and in several cases two UFOs. One witness saw a ray of light emitted from the object that illuminated the Earth's surface. 
if there are so many rumors and talks about UFOs, sooner or later government will ask its intelligence. What's going on, guys? Explain us. And KGB had to create this file with all the publications abroad and some witnesses who saw or thought that they saw it. Is it possible that this 1990 incident could have been a simple military test sent up from the grounds at Kapustin Yar? Or was it yet another incident involving UFOs? Coming up, shown for the first time outside of Russia, exclusive footage of what might be the only recorded evidence of a fireball UFO crash. If the Soviet Union had not imploded under its own weight in the early 1990s, the chilling accounts you've just seen of close encounters of the first kind in and around Kapustin Yar would have remained yet another Soviet-era secret. It's different, because the time is different. You know, if you're talking with elder generation, yes, of course, no question about this. But nowadays, absolutely different. You know, uh, younger generation now, they are living in another society and they have much more freedom. This new freedom in Russia helped the producers of this program acquire, through official channels, this Soviet military footage you are about to see. Throughout the 50s and 60s, the Soviet military experienced a string of failed rocket launches and missile tests that resulted in one disaster after another at the base. Were these simply accidents? or retaliatory attacks by UFOs. I have heard a story, for what it's worth, and I don't usually talk about myths, but I've heard that four Soviet big launch vehicles were exploded on the pads by aliens because they kept trying to shoot down the flying saucers. Hidden from view for 45 years, a Soviet military cameraman captured the after effects of what appear to be two fireball-shaped UFOs that reportedly crashed early on June 3, 1960. From what we can determine, not a single person outside of the Soviet military and KGB has ever seen this footage. Three Red Army firemen are seen running from this massive fireball, which, according to reports, continued to expand, causing other massive explosions in the area for over an hour. One of the fireball-shaped UFOs was believed to have destroyed three Soviet rockets on their launch pads, while the other targeted and destroyed a rocket fuel depot, all just yards from the Zitkur underground UFO research facility. The charred remains of the two reported UFOs seen here were quickly sent across the base to Zitkur. Try and imagine Earth as an undeveloped colony. And just like the United States and the Soviet Union fought wars over other areas, political wars over other areas, imagine the aliens want our resources. And they're fighting over Earth the same way the U.S. and the Soviet Union had conflicts over other areas after World War II. How could all of these shocking events have been held back from the public for so many years? The Stalin's time and early post-Stalin times, everything was restricted. So he was not allowed to talk about this. In uh, Stalin time, they will simply send you to the prison. Could all of these UFO accounts and the trail of freshly unearthed evidence of UFOs be attributed to logical explanation? Or is it possible that strange things really do happen in Russia? A reporter for one of America's largest newspapers says yes. In May 2005, Reports reached the Moscow Bureau of the Los Angeles Times that a lake about three hours away from Moscow had simply vanished. We went up there because we heard that it had just disappeared and I said, you know, I'm not going after the story. A lake does not just disappear. Kim Murphy visited the site a few days later. Her account was published on the front page of the newspaper on May 27, 2005. We got up there and just found this huge hole in the ground. The only eyewitness, as far as we know, who actually saw what happened described going down to the lake where he says there's this swirling of water that looks like water going down a toilet bowl, just, you know, in a, a raging circle, just tumultuous. And it's going and it's going and it's going and pretty soon it's gone. 
from disappearing lakes to fireballs seen in the sky to reported attacks by cigar-shaped UFOs. Russia continues to be a land of incredible mystery. And as top secret work continues to this day at Kapustin Yar and Zidkur, the base remains a potent lightning rod for UFO activity. According to one researcher, Kapustin Yar was the site of a crash in 1989. And even more recently, the debris of a 1997 crash in Poland was taken to Kapustin Yar for analysis. Recent political moves by Russian President Vladimir Putin have caused some in the West to accuse his government of closing the Iron Curtain once again on today's vibrant Russia. On a day-to-day -day basis, uh, people are convinced and worried that Putin's Russia is a much more authoritarian Russia than was Yeltsin's Russia. They do know that UFO information is not available from Russia as easily as it had been before. You lose the ability to control secrets in an open society. Putin came out of the KGB. He's seeing a lot of valuable information and valuable technology go to private sources. The Soviet Union is closing down, closing down in a lot of areas, but also closing down in UFOs. It might be even longer until the curtain is pulled back on the secret underground laboratories and lairs of this legendary Area 51 of Russia. And we have only just begun to scratch the surface for puzzling mysteries of Russia's Roswell. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Seeing is believed.